Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and as usual, I'm going to be your fabulous hostess for this hour of interesting interview and discussion. Uh, today, it's my great pleasure to have uh, on the series that we call Voices of Our Lives, California Assembly Member Ricardo Lara, who represents the 50th Assembly District in Southern California in the southeast portion of LA County. He's a boy who grew up there and a man who is representing them now. Welcome, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank really you. glad to have you here. Oh, it's great to be here. It's great. So um, generally, this is uh, this kind of series that I do with, with 101s, I like to kind of start at the beginning and s let my viewers know kind of who you are and where you came from. So um, talk a little about where you grew up and uh, your family. Absolutely. I, I grew up in East Los Angeles, California. And uh, you know my f parents are both immigrants from Mexico, uh, raised five of us in East LA, and so we've lived around the east side of LA for uh, you know uh, our entire lives. And uh, they're my mother's a seamstress, my dad's a factory worker, and I'm very proud of them. They've done a great job in not only raising us, but you know contributing to the fabric of this country. And you had siblings. You said five kids. Yes, I have two older sisters and two younger brothers. So what yeah. was it like growing up in East LA? Uh, I mean, I loved it. it it's such a, an amazing place, full of history. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, it, it took for me to go to college to really understand the dynamics and, and the history uh, in, in terms of civil rights movements mm -hmm. uh, in California and in the United States. I learned in college about the student walkouts of the 60s. Mm -hmm. I learned about you know, the Chicano moratorium, mm -hmm. where Latinos and Mexican Americans were fighting for their rightful place in this country. And, and so I, I, I'm very proud to be from East LA. It's, it's, a, it's a great place full of culture and tradition, and uh, I love it, it's beautiful. So uh, did you go to public schools there? Yes, I did. I went to public schools uh, along with my brothers and sisters our entire life. Uh, and I graduated from Garfield High School in East LA. And so what were your interests in school? What was it like for you as a kid? For me as a kid, uh, you know, my parents did a very good job of, you know, supporting anything we wanted to do. They were, they might not have understood what we were, what we were getting involved in, <laughs> you know, as, as immigrants and then, you know, them struggling with the language, but they were always there for us. Uh, I was involved in leadership. I was involved in band. Uh, I played the clarinet and eventually became the drum major <laughs> and eventually uh, ended up leading the LAUSD honor band uh, in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena oh, wow. in 1993. That was a great, great moment for me. And so I'm a big supporter of the arts in our high schools, uh, ensuring that we keep those resources for our kids. Uh, and, you know, I was, you know, was one of those fun kids that just wanted to take advantage of everything that high school had to offer. Well, one of the things I think about uh, art, the arts in high school and uh, in, in junior high too, right. uh, I've heard a lot of stories from men and women in our community uh, who are now, who now realize that they were gay or right. lesbian, who uh, felt like the arts were kind of a, uh, a place where they could fit in and be different all at the same time. Right. Uh, did you, uh, right. was that the same for you? You, know, you were I, in leadership too. I was in leadership, I was involved. That's usually in kind of a conformity thing. Right, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was giving you a little bit of both, how's that? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I guess you're absolutely right. I mean, I wanted to express myself creatively and I've played an instrument since I was in elementary school. And again, my parents were supportive of, of that as well and so it, you know, I, I learned to understand and appreciate music at a whole different level and I wanted to continue that uh, and then it wasn't until I got to junior high where I got involved in uh, my journalism co course and ironically enough it, it was a lesbian professor who of, journalism. of my journalism course uh -huh. who was amazing she taught me I mean I fell in love with journalism in junior high in eighth grade and she really helped me not only in my writing skills but photography and you know how do how do you compile a story and how do you construct and you know a, a story that makes sense and and uh, that has the facts and so I since that day I realized I want to major in journalism mm -hmm. and so I never I never changed majors I kept on I added majors 
but I always knew I wanted to major in journalism and you know quite honestly I wasn't that good at math either so I was <laughs> like you know it's just something that I that, I really understand. that I can do that. <laughs> so did the kids know that this teacher was a lesbian? You know what I no I don't think so in retrospect and thinking back now and uh, you know I, I think about Ms. Humphreys and I'm like Wow, that was amazing, you know? So when did it occur to you, well, there's gonna be a couple questions right, about right. this stuff. Um, when did it occur to you, or did you come to the conclusion that this woman must have been a well, lesbian? In high school, when I went back, I was recruiting for our high school band, and I was back at my junior high, and I actually just had the conversation with her. Mm. I asked her, and you know, she was a little, you know, she was very proper and, you know, and so I asked her, and she's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a lesbian. And I, I wanted to tell her that, you know, I was gay as well. And the, the impact that she made in my life was tremendous. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even at, you know, that level. It wasn't right. talking about her sexuality, but it was about more her teaching and her, um, you know, pushing me to be a better student. And well, that's what we were thinking when right. we first uh, instituted National Coming Out Day. I mean, the notion was, if you just knew how many of these people who had been important to you right. in your life, you know, the nurse right. in the hospital or your third grade teacher or whatever, exactly. it, you would feel differently about the community. Right. What about your own personal story? Did you uh, begin to sense that you might be gay, like, really young? Well, or I knew I was different when I was probably in third or fourth grade. Hmm. I mean, I just knew, I don't know what it was, I don't know what to call it, but I knew I was just different. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting because in retrospect, thinking about, you know, okay, I have these different feelings, I'm not kind of going along with the group. I grew up, you know, 10 guys in our neighborhood, mm -hmm. and we were very, cl we're, we're very close still. And, you know, I was just uninterested in some of the things they were doing mm -hmm. or talking about. And I was just like, you know, I, I'm different. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. And it wasn't until I got, I think, to junior high when I really understood. I'm like, oh, I'm gay, mm -hmm. you know. And, of course, starting to deal with that in a Latino community and a predominantly Latino school system uh, in, in the east side of L.A., you, you know, you're kind of thinking back your head, no, I don't know. You know, just kind of, you know, you go through the, I guess, what would be well, a Well, you normal. probably don't want to be. I mean, right. at first, you'd have right. to think that it was uh, right. kind of scary. Or it was. It was. It was very scary. And for me, in, in, you know, the religious sense of it, you know, we're a Catholic family. Mm -hmm. And so I just remember just understanding that, you know, people like me are going to go to hell. And mm -hmm. I, I never quite understood that. And so Did I never confess. No, I never confessed. <laughs> okay, I was raised Catholic. I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I, we, I mean, we would go to confession, but I never, you know. Right. I mean, you're kidding me? There's That's no just way. something you can't talk right, about. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, and there's always that fear, you know. Sure. And and for me, uh, it was just just not, you know. I was like, why, why, why am I gonna go to hell? Why am I gonna be treated different? And so, you know, the the earlier parts of my childhood. I was very, I mean, I was a, you know, insomniac. I wouldn't sleep because I wanted to, I wanted to understand and I wanted, and I kept on always questioning myself. Like, why, why me? Why am I different? Why am I gay? You know, why did God make me this way? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then I guess, you know, as in, in terms of a self coping mechanism, I was like, well, I wouldn't be like this if I couldn't handle it. Right. And I was like, if, if God wanted me to make, be this way, then there's a reason for it. And so I kind of reverted to that notion, and that's kind of what I what I hung on to growing up was like, yeah, I'm different, and I'm meant to do something. I'm meant to be somebody or help somebody because I'm different. And did you talk to anybody about it or tell a friend or? I didn't tell a friend until high school. And so, you know, the importance of having mentors and people to t talk about at an early age is essential because I could have avoided so much heartache and so much stress. You know, a, a kid in elementary and junior high should not be going through the, the amount of stress in terms of figuring out who you are and mm -hmm. figuring out how to love yourself and that you're going to be okay. You know, and, and in high school, it's when I kind of just rebelled and was like, you know, I'm gay and I don't know what this means yet. I don't know if I accept it myself, but this is who I am and I'm going to have to figure out a way to be okay with it. And, you know, I, I had a girlfriend in high school because I wanted to make sure, you know, you always <laughs> want to make sure. Just in case. <laughs> right, just in case. Just in case I don't have <laughs> to go through all of it. Exactly, you know. I know. And um, 
It's it's so funny because I I you know my my girlfriend or ex girlfriend I should say we're friends and she's like was it me was it me and it's funny <laughs> how straight people always make it about themselves right <laughs> oh you know oh I always knew or why didn't you tell me I'm like wait it's not about you it's about me trying to tell you who I really am right <laughs> so yeah you know she's she was just like you know I kind of knew that you were different but and so for me I was like I just thanked her I'm like oh, thank you for just helping me find out who I was and okay. when I finally said okay Ricardo you're gay. Mm -hmm. clearly you're gay and you're gonna be fine you know and so but it, it was tough I mean high but school but you was were a tough also place. still in leadership too or you were right. you were in government in high school yeah I was involved in student government I was involved because that's in a very public thing right even, you know at right. that level yeah and, and it's funny because I always loved being involved I loved being part of a, a community I love being part of activities and so that was just who I am I'm a very social person by nature, and so I loved getting involved. I loved going to school. Like high school for me was one of the best best times of my life. <laughs> I loved it. Hmm. So what about college came next? So college, I went to college in, in San Diego mm -hmm. and um, further trying to understand myself. And I mean, of course, college is, is college, right? You, you get to experiment and you get to right, it's a live your life. To it, it was amazing. And, and to me, I was so grateful because I was the first to go to college in my family. Uh -huh. So I had no idea what to expect. My parents would always say, Ricardo, you're gonna go to college. We have no idea how you're gonna do it. We can't help you, uh, but we'll, tr we'll support you. But you have to go to college. You have to be the first. And so this pressure of just getting into college and then graduating, uh, but then giving uh, myself uh, the space to grow and to develop and to, figure out what I wanted to do. And so I joke with my parents now, I said, look, my bachelor's degree is all yours. I'm gonna get my master's in whatever I want, because that's <laughs> gonna be for me. You know, I'm gonna decide what I wanna do. And you were pretty active in college too, Yeah, right? in college, I, and I, I promised myself that in college I wasn't gonna get involved in anything. I was gonna focus on studying and focus on getting out of college in four years. No, that <laughs> didn't happen. I couldn't help it. I, you know, uh, the, the student body president at San Diego State University uh, at the time when I was a freshman was from Bell, California, which is in my, around my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was amazing that somebody from my neighborhood was a student body president of a university. And um, I, I kind of saw him as a role model. I got involved heavily in um, different co college organizations. And then in California here, we had Prop 209. Uh, and that really started getting me involved mm -hmm. in terms of fighting for working people, fighting for, for people of color, and ensuring that you know we had our place. And so it kind of just drew me back to my roots in East LA, and you know thinking about that so many people sacrificed so much in the 60s uh, and the 70s to ensure that you know Mexican Americans had their place in higher education, and. I felt compelled I had to do something about it. I had to continue this fight as a tribute not only to them, but to the kids that are currently going through school now and that need folks like me, ensuring that we keep the doors of higher education open. And that's why higher education for me is, I, I love to, to craft policy around it. I love the subject because it is the only reason I'm here today. It is the only reason why I got elected to the legislature because somebody gave me a shot to go to school. And it was affordable, somewhat. Right. I mean, it keeps right. getting worse and worse. Right. I mean, there's so many of our colleagues in the legislature, um, mostly on the other side of the aisle, who will not right. you know, vote to have higher education funded, right. even though they themselves went our to public universities exactly. and public colleges, you know, right. and the, at the cost reduction, et cetera. Right. It's sort of like uh, a combination between dog in the manger and uh, biting the hand that feeds you. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, it's really disheartening to see that we, I mean, we always talk about our country needing an educated workforce. We always talk about the fact that we have to compete at a global scale, but yet we keep on cutting back on higher education, which is the one institution that is supposed to provide this educated workforce that we need for you know, for our country. But you know, it's funny, I'm, I don't know if you experience the same thing. When you're a student, you don't really understand what's being Right. done for you right. because you pay some you know right. fees and you work hard and right. all of that but 
So you were active in Mecha and uh, yes. a number of uh, I was Chicano organizations? I was involved in Mecha. I um, took several Chicano studies courses, uh -huh. and I f loved it. Yeah. I got Because you said that's where you kind of right. got the history. Right. Piece. Yeah. I was sitting in, cl in class when we're look watching this movie about the Chicano movement and seeing, you know, a, an, an anti-Vietnam rally in East L.A. and having the police just brutally attack people in, in my community who were just wanted peace, right. you know, and, and they wanted their peace, you know, and they wanted to participate in a demonstration. Uh, and to me, that was eye opening. And yet I was I was thrilled to see that I came from such a progressive and activist community. And so I, I loved it. And I just and, you know, embraced Chicano studies. I embraced the professors because the other thing was, you know, in college, you don't tend to see, prof you know, Latino professors, at least when I was there. Right, right. And so you kind of cling to folks that ha share your experiences. Uh, and to me, it was amazing. Now, were you drawn at all to any gay activism in college? Yeah, or? Uh, you know, we worked hand in hand with uh, the LGBT groups, African American organizations, women's organizations, and we just created our own rainbow coalition, per se. And we actually ran elections for student body, uh -huh. and I actually got elected student body vice president uh -huh. at San Diego State. And were you out to friends yeah, while you I, were in Yeah, I was out. I was out, uh, but I wasn't, I, you know, it, as a part of, it was a time in my life where I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be the gay guy. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. if people would ask me, I would say, yes, I'm, I'm gay. But I didn't, I, I don't know, I guess it's like the second level of kind of transitioning to being okay with being it's gay. It's understandable. Right? I mean, really, you don't want to put yourself in harm's way. With right. race, it's kind of like, I can't hide that. Right. <laughs> exactly. And you weren't you hiding either face. about right. sexual orientation, right. but it's kind of like, well, right. you know, I don't need any more grief. Exactly. Well, uh, yeah, you're right. In a way. Right. You're absolutely right. I'm like, God, I, I'm trying to figure out, I was trying to figure out who I was ethnically and culturally mm -hmm. in my place in this country. You know, you hear, you know, I have friends who can trace their families back to generations and, you know, in this country or in some other, you know, some other part of the world. And I, I felt that I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt I had my family in Mexico, but when I would go to Mexico, they would consider me white. Mm. And when I would come here, people thought I was Mexican. Mm -hmm. And so I was, you know, you, you live in this duality where you are, you're trying to find out who you really are. You know, you go back home and they're like, oh no, no, you're American, you're, you're white. You're mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. like us. Mm -hmm. And you come here, and the whole country is telling you, oh, no, you're Latino, you're foreign, mm -hmm. you're, you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. Even given our, you know, centuries of living in the southwestern part of the United States. Right, of course. You know, so it's, it's that kind of like what I was trying to find myself first. Uh, I knew I was gay, I knew I was Latino, but I wanted to know who I was culturally mm -hmm. and ethnically mm -hmm. and where I belong. And so, you know, when I developed my Chicano identity, I realized that it's, that consciousness, a political consciousness, um, and that you belong to the world. You don't, you don't trace it to one specific place. Mm -hmm. And your job is to, to fight for the civil rights of everyone. So what did you do after college? After college, I, I mean, I was hooked in, in politics. Uh -huh. I, I loved it. I, I understood that it really mattered who was making the decisions in order to distribute resources. And so uh, I really wanted to you know, take a taste of working in the legislature. So I, I took a job working for an assemblywoman at the time out of um, Ontario, California, the Inland Empire, and loved the job. I mean, you were I, working in her district office? I was working in, in her district office. Uh -huh. And um, you know, did everything from going to events and presenting on her behalf and staffing her at events. And I just saw how people really enjoyed having the assemblywoman at their events, how we were really able to help people. And at the time, you know, the state was in, in much better uh, circumstances that we were giving out money to create community centers and parks. Right. And we really transformed her district. You know, they call that pork. Right. <laughs> it's just the most ridiculous thing right. to me. You know, right. you get a community center in a neighborhood that doesn't even have a park. Right. 
And uh, anyway, I, I yeah. told people when I got a community center in my district, this is pork. Right. So they gave me a little pig angel with wings. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> for, you know, I love it. This is good pork, they yeah, said. Yeah, exactly. Because it's just, it's like it doesn't benefit you directly. It's right. about your community. Exactly. And, you know, God forbid you work hard in the legislature and try to bring some resources uh, to your community. I mean, that's what it's all about, representative right. government. And so I, I, I spent uh, a year working for her in the district. She then runs for the state senate. Mm -hmm. uh, in a special election, wins her Senate seat. And I told her, you know, I, I would love to be in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. uh, I went with her to see her get sworn in, uh, in in the state Senate. And she hadn't told me that she was gonna offer me the job until I got over there. And uh, once, you know, we had a little break, she called me in and she says, welcome, this is your office. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You didn't, <laughs> no heads up? <laughs> uh -huh. But yeah, that was, that was her style. She just wanted to make sure that I was serious about moving. And so next thing you know, I'm running to the mall and trying to get some suits because I only have brought one. And I ended up working with her for another year. And then really just once I learned the ins and outs of working in the Capitol as a staffer, I figured I would really love to represent my community and work for the assembly member who uh, represents where I grew up. I go, that would be a huge blessing for me to be in Sacramento fighting for people like my parents. Mm -hmm, and right. so luckily there was an opening. I, I think it was just fate. You know, it just worked itself out. I ended up interviewing for the assembly member who represented the 50th district. Uh, and I got the job and I stayed working with him for over, for his entire term, the six years in the assembly. And he turned out to be an older brother for me. I mean, really cultivated. He was an amazing guy. He was fascinating. Marco Fireball. Yeah. yeah. So I remember Fireball is my political hero. Well, let me go back to Nell Soto for a minute. And uh, I, I didn't ask you this question in our interview and just say to me, I wasn't there or I don't know or I don't want to answer that. Your bill? Did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was there. Yeah. There were eight mm -hmm. Democrats that didn't vote for the bill to protect kids in school uh, on the basis of sexual orientation. Right. Um, and it failed the, you know, the actually first, before Nell was there, right. it failed under the Republican regime. Right. Then it failed the second session when we just took the place right. back when Nell was there. Um, and of course, I, I was even more angry at her because she had a gay son. Right. Um, but I guess my question is, I, there's nothing you can do to make a member, uh, staff can do. Right. I'm not saying, Ricardo, why didn't you get right. her to vote? But did it affect you in any way that she wouldn't protect us in schools? You know, it, it was it was tough. That day was very tough because I knew I can relive that vote and getting her out of the uh, the Capitol as soon as possible because, <laughs> yeah, because I knew I was going to kill her. Because I knew she kills <laughs> coming. <laughs> so you know, and and she yeah, she, you know, she has a she has a gay son, and her top consultant and fundraiser was a gay man. Right. And you know, I know the conversation they had uh, with her consultant. And she says, look, how, do my, how am I gonna vote on this? And her consultant pretty much said, you know, it's, I, I didn't work this hard to get you elected to lose your race over this vote. Because the people in the Inland Empire, right. they're not gonna understand. Right, and you know, for me as a staffer, I was like, well, we can make them understand. We can work, we can, and it's gonna take a lot of work, but we have to, I mean, we're elected, to represent our communities, but yet we're also, ob you know, obligated to, you know, have these conversations try with to our lead communities. The way a little bit, exactly. You know? God forbid we try to lead a little bit, but you know. She changed though. Oh yeah, she did. You know, the Once Senate makes you feel a little more secure, right? Because you've been elected several times, and now right. you're in the Senate. You only got one more to go. Right. Right. Um, yeah, Nell right. and I got along very well in yeah, the Senate. I mean, I, great. you know, I, I really loved her, and, but boy, I, you're right to get her out of the building that day. <laughs> We had like. we had a contingency. <laughs> we're like, you're voting, and we're putting you in the car, and you're on the way to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was tough. I bet it was. I bet it yeah. was. But working for Marco, what were the uh, what were the issues that uh, that Marco focused on that you got to work with him on? So with Marco, um, again, it was you know his personal experience. He was one of the first uh, Mexican-born legislators uh, in the state legislature, and. Um, he really focused on immigrant rights, on ensuring that 
English language learner kids in our schools had the tools and resources they need to succeed. And I loved it because those were issues facing our community now. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the first bill that I worked with him, and, and I, I still can't believe we were able to get this bill signed after it was vetoed the year before uh, by the same governor, um, it was a bill to allow undocumented students to pay in-state tuition at our public colleges and universities. We, we really, you So know, these were kids that actually lived in California, right. grew up in California. These are kids that have been in this state. Simply that their parents were, were undocumented, right. so. Right, that's exactly what it is. They were this. making them pay out of right. state. They could go to college, they but can they go were to college. Like out of state tuition. Right, they were, pay, they were paying tuition as they were international students. Hmm. So it was three, four times the amount. Sure. And, um, you know, we, these are kids that by no fault of their own were brought to this country and no, no other country as theirs. They, for the most part, only speak English and you know, have never been back to wherever country they're from. And so, and a lot of them, sadly enough, they had no idea they were undocumented mm -hmm. I mean, until it came time to fill out your financial aid application mm -hmm. when you were going to college. And how devastating I, I thought it would be for somebody who has no idea they're undocumented and their parents wanted to kind of you know, shelter them from that so they wouldn't feel stigmatized or, or feel they were less than anybody. But it was truly a disservice they were, t they were doing to their children, not preparing them to ultimately figure out how they were gonna right. pursue their college right. education. And these were kids that were pulling, you know, 4.2s, 4.3s, student body presidents, soccer uh, captains, and you know, it just broke my heart because I knew how much a college education gave me. It opened my eyes to the world, right. especially coming from East LA where the majority of folks are Latino. You know, I'll tell you the first per time I actually spoke to a white person or an African American were my two roommates in college. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to not be able to have, give that uh, student opportunity that worked so hard to, right. to get there and, uh, and have their world you know, just be open to any possibility uh, of which uh, college education gives you broke my heart. And so I, I delved into that issue. And luckily, and in 2001, we were able to uh, get that bill signed. And, you know, to this day, I still get emails from students who are now in law school and med school or in undergrad saying, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. So um, when did you start thinking about running yourself? It must have been a little bit of a, uh, a, a, a problem just in thinking about it. Right. Because no gay person's been elected in right. the East LA district. Right. Uh, although we do have a speaker from right. not very far away right. who's a gay Latino. Right. That must have been a leadership right. uh, good thing. Oh, that was great. That was great. When did you start thinking about running? You know, I never had it and, and I, I you know I never really thought I was gonna run because as an out you know gay Latino working in the east side of town I always said to myself oh I'm gonna be the behind the scenes guy mm -hmm. I'm gonna help other folks get elected and I'm gonna work on policy issues I, I just loved it and so I don't know if I kind of subconsciously just decided that because I knew that, I w that was never gonna be an option for me mm -hmm. to run for office uh, but it wasn't, you know, I was working for Speaker Fabian Nunez mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we had been good long, long time friends uh, when he was a lobbyist for LAUSD and he would come into our office and I was the education guy. Uh -huh. So he had to come lobby me on issues when I was a staffer and next, you know, he's the Speaker of the Assembly. <laughs> and so, you know, he, he had a, he had a, I mean, he, he's another guy. I mean, I've been so blessed to have such great political mentors uh, who are, are straight Latino men, mm -hmm. you know? And he, he tells me, Ricardo, it's time for you to run. Hmm. You've done, you know, you have worked in the legislature now. I had worked for the legislature for almost 13 years. And uh, I was okay with it. I was fine with the work I was doing. But he, tell, he told me, you know, it's time. You need to really consider running for office. And I said, oh no, not me, there's no way and you know, I'm gay, and he's like, I don't care. He says, look, I'm gonna, he literally told me, you have a month to just kinda go through the motions and you know, get yourself together, uh, and you we're gonna open a committee in a month. Hmm. And I was like, he can't be serious. He's, you know, he's a jokester. I'm like, no, that's not for me. And um, that month, 
was life changing mm -hmm. because there were days that I was like, there's absolutely no way I'm running. I can't. What am I going to tell people when they ask me, you know, if I'm gay or not? Or why am I not married? I don't have a family. I mean, in terms of my own nuclear family, how, you know, I'm going to run against somebody who has and the wife. And had you told your folks even? No, I hadn't even told my folks that I was running yet. Cause I don't mean running. I mean about being gay. Oh, yeah. No, my parents knew already. And that was the other thing was I don't want to put them through right. through this. I parents can, have to come out too. When exactly. You come out to them, it's kind of exactly. like all their friends want to know. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when the hit pieces start coming or, you know, the, the slandering happens, you know, my mom, you know, would take that so hard. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I had to weigh all that in. A and it wasn't about me, it was about my family. Right. And so uh, when, when I decided to do this, I was scared. Mm -hmm. It was very, very scary for me. Uh, and knowing that, you know, there was pioneers like yourself and, and Tama Miano and folks in San Francisco. And I actually had some folks who told me, you know, if you really want to run for office, <laughs> you should really move to the west side of LA, move to West Hollywood, you know, move to Silver Lake. And I'm like, what am I going to do there? I, I, <laughs> they don't even know I me. They didn't know me. Like, you know, like, right. and, and I was like, okay, this is going to be interesting because I knew I was the best qualified. I knew that I had put in my time and I know that I was the candidate that would be able to really work on bringing resources to the community. So what's the first thing you remember in terms of going and actually talking to a group and saying, hi, I'm Ricardo Lara and I'm running for the State Assembly? Oh my God, I mean, that was, it, it because was Because that's the moment where right. you're thinking, oh my God, it's I'm gonna give my stump speech and yeah. then it's open for questions. Right. And, you have to and you have to make people believe right. that you have to, really feel it and own it and say yeah I'm gonna win and this is why I'm gonna win and it's so tough it's so easier said than done to actually because you're nervous you're scared you're putting yourself out there you have no idea if you're gonna win let alone if this organization or these group of folks are gonna support you but you have to act like you're the guy you're winning right and and that was that was uh, you know a, a balance that I had to find because it wasn't me it wasn't like I walk around like oh yeah I'm I have all the answers and I'm your guy and I'm gonna get up there you know but I I had this passion for service and I would commit myself to working on issues but I didn't want to come off as that guy you know mm -hmm. the guy that's just kind of trying to bulldog so did you get any everybody. help with how to answer the question if it came up like why yes. don't you have a girlfriend yes I um, the victory fund uh -huh. in my opinion, has the best campaign training uh, program. And I would recommend it to anybody uh, who's interested in running for office. Uh, I, I flew to DC for the campaign training, specifically to help me address the question of how, how was I gonna answer the gay question. I could answer any question on the economy, transportation, education, the budget, any of that stuff, but the one question that was still lingering out there that I thought is gonna do me in, and this is the trump card that they're gonna pull out, and I'm done. I can be the most eloquent speaker or the best prepared, but how am I gonna talk about being gay mm -hmm. in the east side of town? Mm -hmm. And so I, I was there for three days at the Victory Fund, at the Victory Fund mm -hmm. uh, in Washington, D.C., and the first of all, they, we, they paired us with um, various elected officials throughout the country. Uh -huh. I had a state senator, I think she was from North Carolina, and she tells me, honey, you're worried about running openly gay in LA? <laughs> Try running in North Carolina, where I have my partner and I'm, I was getting attacked left and right, and I still won. And I thought about it, I'm like, you know, okay, I could do this. And we really worked on, you know, pivoting to the issues, mm -hmm. right? And so when we were going through the exercise, I was like a hawk. I was studying, I was practicing, I was in the mirror. I was trying to just prepare myself. And uh, when the time came and we were going through the role playing, I, I nailed it. And I'm like, okay, now I'm unstoppable. Now I, I'm okay. I'm gonna be okay, because I know exactly what I need to do. And so, the, f the first time I came up was in a newspaper uh, interview. Uh -huh. One of the local newspaper uh, folks were interviewing me. And it's interesting how they asked me all about the issues, and I'm on, doing my thing, doing my stump speech. And just about when we're gonna wrap up, um, and I wasn't even expecting it. 
but this is when the training becomes so critical. Mm -hmm. uh, he asked me, so, you know, this part of town is, is very conservative and, you know, we understand you're openly gay and do you think that's going to be a problem for your campaign? And, you know, you think you're going to be able to connect with the voters? And so I did my good old school Victory Fund training. <laughs> I pivoted and I said, let me tell you what the voters of the 50th care about. They care about good jobs, they care about the economy, they care about education, and that's what I'm there. That's what I'm gonna do in Sacramento. You know, the other thing that I found that was very interesting that I had never thought about, because um, when I ran, no gay person had ever even won a primary wow. uh, in the state. And so, um, I, you know, I'm supremely confident I always have been, but <laughs> it was, like you say, yeah. it's scary. And I'm sitting in a restaurant in, uh, I think, Santa Monica, and some big guy comes barreling over to my table and pounds on the table, and he said, you know what, Sheila, I hate all politicians. I hate them. They lie. They dissemble. You can't trust them. They won't tell you the truth. I hate them all except for you. And I said, oh, well, uh, thank you very much, <laughs> but why me? And he said, well, you've already told us the worst thing about yourself, so <laughs> why would you lie about anything else? And oh, thought, my you know, God. It's true in right. a way because coming right. out, it actually does take some courage. Right. And why would you lie about anything else when you've right. already told the hardest truth, you know, that right. you have? And I was amazed because the voters kind of, it became a plus in a way, right. you know, that you were honest enough to be right. out and they, they thought it was courageous. Right. So um, I think that's also something that our candidates don't really right. understand. Is that that's people, interesting. People just want somebody right. that's going to, be honest, you right. know, stand up to the bullies and, right. and really just tell right. them the truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, people, you're absolutely right. When I talk to folks, they're like, look, we're not going to agree on everything, but we just know you're going to be honest right. and you're going to work hard. And of course, that's what I always commit myself to. And did you get a hit piece about no, being I, gay? Um, it was kind of subtle. Yeah. It's always subtle, right? And so I was, uh, this is a hilarious story. You're going to laugh. So I'm figuring out how are they gonna hit me? You know, are they gonna be just blatant and you know put a rainbow flag and <laughs> put the whole works right? This is like the hit piece, um, and of course they, you know were slandering me back and forth on issues, but I was like, okay, when is it coming? When is it coming? I was petrified to go to my mailbox during the campaign because mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want to get another mail another hit piece right, or the hit piece mm -hmm. that one that's gonna you know really fo you know force me to to really, you know, do this. And um, I'm walking precincts on a Sunday. It was a Saturday morning. And of course, I had volunteers everywhere walking. And I get a call and it said, my friend says, oh my God, there's a hit piece with you with a crown on it. I'm like, a crown? Are you kidding me? Like, what, do, what does it look like? What does it say? And I'm like, this is it. This is the hit piece, right? Like they're putting me as like some queen or something, right? And I was like, okay, here it is. Let me see it. And it was, um, it was a king's a king's crown, saying how I'm you know was going I was having fundraisers at the Lakers suite and I'm walking around <laughs> like I'm the king, and I was like, man, shoot! I was like, I thought they were gonna call me a big queen or something. <laughs> so, but you know, they, in that same piece, it, they they did say, you know, Ricardo Lara, he's not on our team. Oh wow! And to me, we're like, okay, this is what they're getting at, mm -hmm. you know. And so I just went into, by that time, you know, a lot of my mentors said, look, you have to develop a hard, hard, some hard skin because when people start attacking you, you're gonna take it personal. No matter what anybody tells you, you always take it personal. You're human. Right. And so um, by that time I had been, you know, the campaign was getting ugly. We we're getting down to the last couple weeks. And so you, I already was used to it. So all I said was, all right, this is a piece. They're trying to insinuate, that's fine. Just give me my precinct, I'm gonna go walk. And that's it, just focus and staying on your campaign strategy of just meeting voters. Because I knew if I just got to the voter, I can convince them. You know, I can talk to them about the issues and I can talk to them about our community. And, th and that's what my strategy was. Before my opponents even hit one precinct walking, I already had walked half the, the district. Uh, so I started way in advance. But you have to work hard. And that was the thing, you know, my, my mentor said, we'll help you, we'll, we'll, you know, help you with some resources, but at the end of the day, it's your name on the ballot. Right. You have to walk, you have to raise the money, and you have to connect with the voters. 
and that's only the beginning of the job. Right. So then you're elected, right. you have a victory, um, and uh, probably winning your primary in those days, we had a primary and right. then a general, um, meant you were probably going to win the general, so you right. have a little time to prepare. Uh, and then you go up the first week in December and you get sworn in. Right. Did your parents go up with you? Yes. I had <laughs> family from Mexico that flew up. They must have been so Both proud. Both my parents were there, my nieces, my nephews. I had a, I think she was six months at the time. The newest member of our family was there sitting with me uh, on the floor of the legislature in the assembly. I mean, you experienced this. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful feeling to be able to, to sit in this regal building in this hall uh, of the assembly and think that I'm now part of this state's history, a state that I'm so proud of. I'm so proud to be Californian. I'm so proud to be, uh, you know, American. And now that I get to, you know, have a little say for the time being about the direction of our state. Um, and, and I always thought of my parents as I had them sitting with me and, you know, my dad's, I saw his hands and how, how beat up they are and, mm -hmm. and my mom with her legs after working as a seamstress for so many years. Uh, I said, only in this great country and, and, and in this amazing state can uh, a son of a seamstress and a factory worker who came here illegally to this country to fight for a better life for us, now their son is in the state legislature. It is amazing. I mean, my mother yeah. was a seamstress when she was 11 yeah. years old because she was wow. an orphan. And my dad worked in uh, an aircraft plant, but mm -hmm. only during the war. And then he was kind yeah. of like an independent, you know, worker yeah. on his own. We never had, we grew up over by the Coliseum. Right. So not too far from East Yeah, LA. no, <laughs> neighbors. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is an amazing thing. You do look around and think yeah. how, and it's really public education. Right public education, especially at the university and college right. level, that gives you that sort of that jump. Right. So you entered the assembly in a pretty bad time. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because you just started this year, we right? We just started. I'm a, I'm a freshman member <sighs> and it, it is really tough. I mean, some of the tough votes we had to take already on the budget were to really limit our social services. Right. And, um, you know, it was, it was a tough vote to take. It's uh, an easier said than done. Mm -hmm. When people, you know, and I can tell you as a staffer, uh, you know, you recommend your boss to vote a certain way or, you know, about some issues, but there's nothing like you being there pushing that button and voting to cut the services that a lot of people in my district depend on. Sure. And, and making those tough decisions uh, is, is just another, it, it takes it to a whole new level. Uh, and, you know, you really, I really internalize you know, my actions in the assembly because I take my job very serious. And this is a, a, a job, uh, although I'm very grateful to be there, um, I have to look out for my constituents mm -hmm. and have to ensure that their kids will still have access to public education, that they still have access to higher education. Well, those cuts that you just made in the, uh, uh, in the legislature, and the budget isn't finished yet, yeah. Uh, because we couldn't get the tax extensions right. on the ballot for people even to vote on. Right. That's only half of what the cuts will right. be if we don't get exactly. the tax extension. Exactly. Because the, the other half will be right, right out of the schools, right. out of the public schools. Again, and it's, it's working people and poor people mm -hmm. that have to pay the price. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the irony about it, about it is when every time we pass a proposition, every time we, we go to the vote, for, uh, you know, we go to the voters for support. Working people and poor people are the first to tax themselves again for parks, for better right, schools, right. for better infrastructure. And yet these communities still remain the same. We still have a 50% dropout rate in some of my high schools. And that's not okay. And by cutting some of these services, we're just telling kids again, you know what, you're gonna have to wait a little longer or you're not as important. Well, but a lot of people in, the, in our districts don't vote. Right. They don't vote, even uh, right. even in the unions. Right. Only 40% of union members are even registered to vote right. in California. Right. I mean, it's you know, it's it gets kind of outrageous, yeah. really. It's an ongoing struggle. Yeah. It's an ongoing struggle to keep people motivated to vote. But tell me what it is from the time you were in junior high school. Wh what do you feel it was that kind of motivated you? You said you're you're devoted to service. 
And I really understand that. It's almost mm. like a, I can't help myself, you know. Right. I see something's wrong. I want to, <laughs> you know, I want to try to fix it. <laughs> I want to yeah. fix it. But what is, what was it you think that really motivated you? You know, um, there's not, I mean, for me, there's no better feeling than when you're able to really transform a person's life and to really improve their quality of life through either just assisting them through the process or creating a policy to help them help themselves, to have somebody achieve their full realization. Uh, and to me, there's no better feeling than that. And in my community, when, I, when, you know, when we help somebody, whether it's just trying to get their license renewed or trying to go through some insurance problem they might have, they are so grateful. You know, people from Latin America don't go to government for help. Right. They run from it. Right. And to see that there is engaged citizens, new citizens now, and they see a district office, and they see it as a place that can help, that government is there to help them and assist them. And when they come back, and you know, recently we have this, we have this uh, lady with some issue, and she came back with tamales for me. And I told <laughs> her, oh, we, you know, we can't accept these. It, you know, we, we don't, you know. But she was just like so grateful that somebody just gave her the time of day to help her out. And to me, that's what it's all about. That is why I do what I do. So uh, you remember the LGBT caucus yes. in Sacramento? Yes. It's a bigger caucus than it's ever yes. been in its life. There's seven I think of when us. I was there we had six and now you've got seven. Seven. So um, seven of us. so you're the what, fourth, fifth or sixth or yeah. seventh person yeah, gay or seventh. lesbian open person right. elected. I right. was the first. Right. And the sixty second woman in the history of California. Wow. There's only been about, I think, 121 women altogether right. through the whole history since the 19th century. Wow. And I was the 62nd. You know, it took a little while. Right. Well, you know, it always takes a while. <laughs> nobody gives does. Nobody gives up power just to give it up. So it's a very diverse, in its own way, caucus. Right. Right. Um, right. Do you like that? I love it. <laughs> I love it. And let me tell you, uh, I'm a proud member of the Latino caucus as well. Uh -huh. And one of the first things we did was we created a subcommittee in the Latino caucus to address Latino LGBT issues. Really? Yes. And Your of course, own honor pack, my huh? own little, <laughs> my own little committee within the Latino caucus. Uh -huh. And so the funny thing is when we're, when I was making my pitch, because we were working on developing other subcommittees, I said, I think this is very important mm -hmm. because now that I'm here and the speaker is also Latino and LGBT, it's time for us to start talking about issues that are important to LGBT Latinos. You right. know, we care about equality, right. but we also care about bilingual education. Right. We care about immigration issues. We care about ensuring that, you know, we address the issue of bullying and uh, depression in our community. Mm -hmm. And how do we start talking about um, LGBT issues within our own families? And so I'm very proud of that. And I'm very proud to be a member of the uh, LGBT caucus. And uh, I think in a month we're going to have a Latino caucus, LGBT caucus hearing uh -huh. on the status of LGBT Latinos in California. Excellent. That's really great. Right. Well, it's been interesting to me because in California, the LGBT caucus has been pretty much 100% progressive. Right. Um, people whose politics uh, have always involved, you know, equality for everybody. Right. I'm pretty sure without exception, right. really, in that group. Right. Um, and it's been very helpful to have LGBT people elected because the progressive caucus, as such as it is, it isn't really a caucus, right. but it just shrinks now. Right. You know, it has shrunk more within the right. Democratic Party, and we've become more and more of the stalwarts, right. really, in terms of progressive legislation. Right. Our job becomes much more important. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, you're absolutely right. And we have to be that ongoing voice for progressive politics and ensuring that those important issues are being still discussed uh, at the state level. There's a lot of people coming along though. So, but I guess the question is personally, um, two things really, is, does it feel lonely to you in Sacramento? I mean, you go away from home, you're there all week, yeah. you're only home on the weekends. It is, it's, it's a very, very kind of lonely job. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're surrounded by people all the time, but I, I have a great group of friends in LA a great family. I miss them terribly when I'm in Sacramento, mm -hmm. but I know, I also know that this opportunity 
is an amazing one. And I have to ensure that I'm not only enjoying myself, but that I keep, you know, focused on the task at hand. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm in Sacramento, I'm going 100 miles per hour and, and trying to get everything done and then trying to find some time to just relax and and have some fun. And but you're a very gregarious guy. I can see <laughs> you going on the floor at 9 o'clock in the morning or noon <laughs> or whenever the session starts and just going from desk to desk and right. saying hi to everybody. It right. is the kind of guy you are, isn't I, it? I, I, yeah, it is. I love <laughs> it. But I have to have my I have to get my work done first. Yeah, yeah I understand. No, it's, it's, you know, you can get, you can get, you can get caught up in, in, in the, any of the, the hardest part is to really try to get some true friends in mm -hmm. Sacramento. Because mm -hmm. everybody's an acquaintance. Everybody now that wants somebody, something from you. And so you just have to keep that in mind. That, you know, some folks are much more transactional. But to really establish and have some good friends, I think, makes it all worth it. Well, I made some of the best friends of my life, and yeah. it was completely unexpected. Right. It's kind of like going away to college, where you think, oh, I'm leaving all my friends, I'm leaving my family, I'm going to college. And then you meet people there, and it's right. kind of like for the rest of your life, right. they've been through that with you. Right. And that's the other thing, is right. it's a very small group of people yeah. who gets it. No, what you know what it's like to be on that floor twice a week, right. to be in those committees. I've got extremely lucky, our freshman class, there's yeah. some extraordinary new members, and so we all always tend to you know stick together and and keep ourselves uh you know on check per se and showing that how are you doing are you okay have you know have you gone to the gym have you eaten because <laughs> you know you you, you forget you, you forget, you forget. I, I sometimes I realize like wow i haven't eaten today or i haven't even had a chance to just take a break right uh because it's, it's so consuming and there's always something important, right? There's always the big issue of the day. There's always something that's going on. And you know, do you choose to engage, or do you do you choose to just let that one go and let somebody else take the lead? Mm -hmm. And you be okay with that. And say, you know, it's okay. I'll track it, and you know, a family member so and so will will address the issue, because it's impossible for you to try to be there and be on top of every issue. You'll go nuts. Right. And so it's important to pick and choose the, the issues that you care about, really master them because we're only there for six years. That's if you get elect, you know, reelected. Um, and so you really want to hone in and, and focus on a few issues that are important to you. So what issues are you thinking you'll focus on? Because I don't think right. people outside of California watching this know uh, we have term limits right. and you get six years in the assembly and then, you know, bye bye. It's really a short right. amount of time to get right. something done. One of my biggest issues is something we've been talking today, higher education. Mm -hmm. Ensuring that every kid has an opportunity to pursue a college education is one of my top priorities. Uh, ensuring that we have the resources and the programs in place so that our first, you know, first generation students or first college, you know, if it's your first time in college, that you have the resources you need so that you can succeed. And you can you know, contribute to the economy at a greater scale, and then you can give back to your community. Higher education, like I said before, is the only reason I'm here. Uh, healthcare is a big issue in my district. We still have hospitals that are closing at mm -hmm. rapid numbers, uh, and people in my community are still traveling to Mexico to right. seek medical care because right. of the sheer fact is that there's a huge language barrier. Mm -hmm. So ensuring that we fight at the federal level to get the appropriate slots of doctors for our state and that we create programs so that we get doctors that can speak the language mm -hmm. and are working in underserved communities is a priority for me as well. Uh, um, uh, environmental justice issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the southeast part of my district have the tradition of having manufacturing plants. Mm -hmm. That's how they started. Steel mills, mm -hmm. you know, tire factories. Uh, unfortunately, you know, what happens with those, with those type of, uh, you know, companies is there's a lot of environmental justice issues, a lot of pollution. contamination right. and pollution in the land and in the air. I have uh, cancer clusters and asthma cl clusters in my district because of the air quality. Uh, and so we have to really work to address these issues. Well, you've got a full plate. <laughs> so I guess uh, my last question will be, uh, people watching the show, like you probably thought or think, I could never do this. I mean, I can't, if once they know that I'm gay or lesbian, I, I can't do this. What would you say to them? I would say you're absolutely wrong. <laughs> and I can't tell you how to get there, uh, but definitely there's 
a whole host of organizations that will help you, like the Victory Fund, you know, like Equality California, that will provide the resources that if you want to make a difference in your community, if you want to run for office, if you want to, you know, be on a commission or a board, absolutely, public service is one of the best things you could do. And I think it's our responsibility as Americans. And, you know, I'm living proof that, you know, you can do it and that there's folks out there that are willing to help you. Uh, and there's nothing better than doing what you love. And I get up every day and pinch myself and say, I can't believe I'm a legislator in the eighth largest economy in the world, in the state of California, a, a state that gave my parents this opportunity. And now I have to make sure that it remains not only the golden state, but it remains a state that provides opportunities for everybody who wants to come here. So I, I, you can absolutely do it. And you know, I, I just, you gotta just work hard. Nothing's easy, as you know. Right. It takes a lot of work, and there's no shortcuts. That's also the thing I learned. You have to work hard. You have to you know, put in the hours, and you have to be really committed to, to doing this. But once you get there, it's, it's beautiful to be able to be there and you know, be another voice for our community, for our LGBT community, for my Latino community, and say, you know, I'm here, and I'm just like you. And I was just, you know, that little kid that was insecure and that was trying to figure out what, you know, why was I different? And now I realize that, you know, I, I, I was given this opportunity and, and I'm gay and I'm proud of it because I get to, you know, really fight for, you know, for what's right. And that's for our civil rights. Ricardo, thank you so much for doing this. I really, thank really you. appreciate it. I know you came down from Sacramento. You're on your way back to Sacramento. <laughs> yes. It was really great for you to thank be you. here. Thank you. Thank you. I thought it was important to, to share my well, story. I'm and, glad you and did, and I'm really glad you were here to share your story. And I'm glad you. you were with us to hear the story. And just remember, live your life fully. Let it all, all be whoever you are and get used to it. Mm.